There's a joke there, but I'm not going there. Right. Okay. Um, just quickly before we jump into what I believe God has given us this morning, just uh, an additional notice that next Saturday, next Sunday afternoon, we have the opportunity as a church to go and do a bit of Jesus-like ministry. Thank you. You remember, Jesus just sent the people out. He sent his disciples out, didn't he? There wasn't any big, clever plan. He just said, we'll go, heal people, cast out demons. We might be doing some of that, you never know. But just go. And next uh, Sunday afternoon, we've got the opportunity to go to Wells next to sea, okay, and uh, meet with uh, some brothers and sisters from some other churches. We're going to Wells because actually... The Baptist church leaders in this area and I would just like, we would long for us to become part of a movement. Well, I was excited about it anyway. <laughs> that actually impacted not just, but a whole area. And we've got North Norfolk surrounded. And actually in Wells, could you just not, could you just pause the record? Is that possible? Sorry for those of you watching this later, but for an evangelical witness in that place. So we're going to meet next week, and we're going to meet at the Sack House, which is part of the theatre there. You know, it's just back from the quay there, okay? The room probably isn't big enough for us all to get in, but we don't care. We're going to get in. We're just going to do a bit of worship, uh, and then we're going to go out. And, and again, it won't be cringy. For those of you who want a bit of real adventure, you'll be able to do that. For those of you who just want to wander around and pray, you'll be able to do that. For those of you who want to stay within the safety of the sack house and pray there, you'll be able to do that, okay. And then we'll get together, discern what God's been saying or attempt to, and then it's fish and chips. Well, it is for you lot. I've gone and double booked myself. I've got to be back to preach at Cowper at half past six, so <laughs> never mind. Anyway, what we're looking at this morning is Isaiah 30. As uh, Steve wasn't able to make and... Uh, whatever. This verse just sprang into my mind. Isaiah 30 verse 15. We're going to read a bit beyond that to get the context. Okay. Isaiah 30 verse 15. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. Now that should get our attention, shouldn't it? the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel. He says this, Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength. But you would have none of it. You said, no, we'll get our help from Egypt. They will give us swift horses for riding into battle. But the only swiftness you're going to see is the swiftness of your enemies chasing you. One of them will chase a thousand of you, five of them will make all of you flee. You will be left like a lonely flagpole on a hill or a tattered banner on a distant mountaintop. So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so that he can show you his love and compassion for the Lord is a faithful God. Blessed are those who wait for his help. O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. He will be gracious if you ask for help. He will surely respond to the sound of your cries. Though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for a drink, he will still be with you to teach you. You will see your own teacher with your own eyes. Your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. Then you will destroy all your silver idols and your precious gold images. You will throw them out like filthy rags, saying, Good riddance. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this word that was for 3,000 years ago and yet is still for today. Lord, release your word among us, we pray. Amen. Most of us know what it's like to live under pressure. Uh, some of you will be in that situation this morning. For much of the life of Isaiah, he and the nation, the little nation that he was part of, lived under pressure. Uh, Isaiah lived in the little land of Judah. He lived in the capital there, almost certainly in Jerusalem, 
uh, Judah, about 100 miles by 75 miles max. You know, it's a tiny little place. And the Assyrians were the superpower of the day. And their empire kept creeping closer and closer and closer. And eventually, of course, the Assyrians overran that northern kingdom of Israel and they encamped on the thin green line. In fact, some of you will know that on one occasion they came right up to the gates of Jerusalem. We'll think about that later. Many of us have been threatened at one time or another in our lives, maybe by a person, maybe by the company that we work for, maybe by illness, maybe our financial situation, or whatever. And it's felt like the Assyrians were encamped at the border of our lives. We were under pressure. And to fall into the hands of the Assyrians was a terrible, terrible thing. You know, we hear of atrocities all the time these days, don't we? Islamic State, ISIS, whatever they call themselves these days. Actually, there's nothing new. The Assyrians were like that. 3,000 years ago. And Isaiah lived and prophesied during the reign of four different kings. And during those reigns, he had an ongoing message. And one of them was a message, a recipe for national security. You find it way back in chapter 7, as he speaks to the king of the time, Ahaz. Actually, at that stage, it wasn't the Assyrians, it was the surrounding nations. But whatever the threat, it was the same recipe. Be careful. Stay calm. Don't be afraid. Don't lose hope. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. In other words, stand firm in your faith. That is enough. Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength. Isaiah's recipe for national security is don't do anything. Just trust in God. And if you think that's an utter nonsense... And actually, God got Hezekiah, who was one of the kings, in a situation where that's all he could do. Because there was a time when the Assyrians did come as far south as the city gates of Jerusalem. There was nothing Hezekiah and the people could do but was trusting God. And actually, if you read, when you get bored, you can read Isaiah 36 and 37 and see the way in which the Assyrians just melted away. Because when they trusted in God, this huge superpower just melted away, because actually they weren't the superpower. The superpower was God. And so remarkable is this event in Isaiah 36 and 37, that actually Isaiah 36 and 37 is a repetition, word for word, of two chapters from two kings. It's one of those few events that we have twice in the Bible. So remarkable is it that God repeats it to remind us what God had done. And in the face of this latest threat of the Assyrians, the Israel, or the Judahites, those who lived in Judah, were looking for a strong friend. And they looked south to the Egyptians. And they were thinking of making an alliance with the Egyptians, and the Egyptians would be able to come and help them. Because, of course, the Assyrians were a threat to the Egyptians as well. You know, if Judah topples, Egypt potentially is next. So they look at making a deal, a treaty, with the Egyptians. And God says, no. No alliance with Egypt. Just rely on me. It's one of the minor debates of the election campaigns. I mean, it's hardly out there, but it is with some of the parties, and it may become an issue, I don't know, later on, depending on what kind of coalition we end up with, if we end up with a coalition. Anyway, we won't go there. But Trident, do we replace Trident or not? I'm not saying for one moment this is what we should do. I'm using this as a parallel, okay? But it's as if a hostile superpower, nuclear superpower, were based in France. And they're just over the other side of the channel. They're pointing their nuclear weapons at us. And God says to us, don't renew Trident, which if you don't know, is part of our nuclear, you know. Don't renew Trident. In fact, decommission what you've got. Just trust in me. That'd go down well on the stampings, wouldn't it? You know, when we have our hustings tomorrow night, if somebody asks about Trident, somebody comes in. Oh, that's our policy is we'll decommission everything and just pray. It's going to go down well, isn't it? That's Isaiah's recipe for national security. Don't rely on the obvious 
and visible for protection. Don't surround yourself with what looks strong and reliable because it isn't. What you cannot see, what is invisible, is more powerful than what is visible and can be seen. And in verse 15 are timeless truths. I've put two different translations up there um, for you to ponder. We could spend 24 hours, we're not going to, but we could spend 24 hours in this verse just looking at the ways in which it is explored and re-emphasised throughout Scripture. Because there are themes here that run throughout the Bible and there are themes which are fulfilled in Jesus. We could spend ages looking at it. We're not going to. I'm going to keep moving as quickly as I can. This uh, is written in poetic language. It's a feature of the Psalms. It's a feature of the prophets. And these couplets, these two lines, they're the same idea expressed in two different ways, and you often find that. And I put two, trans two translations up there because actually, apparently, translating from Hebrew into English is difficult because, you know, their one word has different nuances and different... That's why it's translated in slightly different ways. But the first call is a call to, of repentance. Return to me. And of, as God's people, we do that a lot, and quite rightly, because we're prone to stray. But this verse reminds us, and calls us beyond that, reminds us that repentance is not just saying sorry, but it's actually changing our minds. It's about a change of behaviour. Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. It needs both returning and resting for us to be saved. And this is not talking about eternal salvation. This is talking about deliverance from the threats to our lives. What does it mean to rest in God? Well, first of all, obviously, it means to stop activity. What was the first thing Adam did on earth? Thank you. Nothing. <laughs> he rested. What did God do on the seventh day? He rested. Adam had just been made. He wasn't tired. Does God ever get tired? No. God never gets tired. So why did he rest? Why did Adam rest? There's a point there. We're not human doings, are we? We're human beings. The first part of resting in God is to stop, cease, be still, whatever other language you want to use. We're all different. But we need to find a rhythm in our lives where we do stop where we are still, where we cease. Roy Searle calls this the punctuation marks in our lives. If you get a paragraph of text, right, with no punctuation in it, it's very confusing. Because you don't quite know where one bit runs in. If we live all our lives, activity, 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 it becomes meaningless. There is no sense to it. Where there are punctuation marks, where we have the opportunity to stop actually with God, we begin to make sense of our lives. We begin to understand what God is saying to us. Because we don't only need to stop, but we need to rest in him. Jesus calls that abiding, doesn't he? Abide in him. And then, you see, this whole thing about stopping and resting in God can have a profound impact on our lives. When we stop and rest in God, we're making a decision to relinquish control, to no longer be in charge of our lives, to no longer be in trying to sort everything out. But we stop. And we leave all that mess on one side, and we focus, and we concentrate on God. It becomes a cessation of self-reliance, and that's what's going on in these verses, you see. God says, I'm enough. <laughs> Judah, I'm enough. Judah, I'm enough. You don't have to go to... But it's not enough for Judah. They weren't God and Egypt as well. <clears throat> Frenzied activity, restless anxiety, striving. When we stop... We can let go of control. 
Some of us are desperately tired because we're desperately trying to control outcomes in our lives. Some of us are desperately tried, tired because we're trying to desperately control other people in our lives. When we stop and rest in God, we let go of that. And we hand it back over to God, who's Lord anyway. He's Lord anyway, isn't he? So why are we trying to control and carry all these things that actually we've got no control or right over anyway? When we stop and we rest in God, we make a conscious decision to hand over control to him. It's about our hearts. Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from your heart. It's a bit like these sprinters. You know, it makes me laugh. When they, when they show the, the kind of action replay afterwards and they show the sprinter, they say, wow, look at the way he's running. He's so relaxed. <laughs> relaxed. This bloke's running quicker. A hundred, you know, hundred metres. He's doing that quicker than I can do ten metres. And he's relaxed. Yeah, he's relaxed. Whereas the sprinters were striving and anxious and tense. Their rhythm goes, they're not able to do it. It's not about resting in God. It's not about not doing anything. It's about where we live out of. (coughs) Living out of God. Living out of that place of peace and rest in him. I hope you realise, actually, this way of living is an insult to Western philosophy. Because Western philosophy thinks that we can manage and control our lives. We can be whoever we want to be. Rubbish. We can't control our lives. We can't manage everything. It's time we relaxed, let God be God, and enjoyed it. Get the same ideas in the next couplet, don't we? Um, In quietness and confidence is your strength. uh, Quietness means to be unconcerned, undisturbed, It's kind of living with shalom. It's just living at rest, actually. And we all desire that, don't you? Don't you desire to live like that? Quiet, undisturbed. We think if we're going to live like that, then everything around us is going to be quiet and undisturbed. That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about in here being quiet and undisturbed, and everything around here might be utter chaos and a nightmare. You know, it's like the image of the wheel, where the, the, the rim of the wheel is whipping round and round and round, and yet at the centre, at the hub, nothing moves. It's the ideas we find in Psalm 62, verse 1, I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. It's a battlefield image. I'm on the battlefield, and yet I wait quietly for God, because he is the one who brings victory. Psalm 131 is a living example of this abiding, of this quietness. It's about leaving the big things with God. Sorry, I thought I might be able to read my screen, but I can't, so I better find it in the Bible. Psalm 131, you know, it starts with this. Lord, my heart is not proud, my eyes are not haughty, I don't conserve myself with matters too great or awesome for me to grasp, you know. Lord, I leave the big things with you. I'm not going to try and control them any longer. I leave them with you. And then there's this image, isn't there, of, of, the, of the weaned child. What's a weaned child? A weaned child is one who no longer needs its mother's milk. Now, an unweaned child sits on its mother's lap and it has one thought in its mind, doesn't it? Feed me. Whereas a weaned child sits on its mother's lap for a completely different reason just wants to be with mum. And you know, we need to cultivate in our lives the desire just to be with God. Not so that he will answer my prayers or that he will speak to me, but just to be with him. God wants us. God wants us. Confidence is a word used a lot by Isaiah. We tend not to notice in our English translations because it's linked to the word for trust, uh, the word for security, the word for safety. 
Strength, ironically, is warrior strength. It's a bit of a, I was going to say oxymoron. It's more words than you can use for an oxymoron, but it's illogical, actually, isn't it? In quietness and confidence, there is warrior strength. Really? Well, in God there is. In God there is. Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength. Do you believe that? Don't, you don't need to, you know, I don't, I'm not looking for a response like, yes. But in your heart, do you believe that? Does it make any sense to you that this is a way to live? Because the question is, if it is a way to live, and I think actually it's a way to life, let's go back to it. What are we going to do about it? Because I suggest to you that inevitably it will look different in your life to my life, because we're all different. And what works for me won't work for you, and so on, because we're unique individual creatures of God. But I just suggest to you some things that I have found helpful in this whole, whole, whole area. Uh, but how it works for you, I don't know. I mean, this whole idea of a rhythm of life, creating a rhythm. How do you start your day? How do you end your day? Where's God in that beginning and ending of your day? Where does God fit in the different parts of your day? Because as Roy Searle would say to us, there are punctuation marks. There are already breaks in your day where you could consciously be still and know that he is God. Many of you use that car journey, don't you? The uh, midday prayer of the Northumbria community was deliberately timed to take no longer than it takes for a kettle to boil. So actually you could use it while you were waiting for the kettle to boil. I think it was written before fast boil kettles, but that's another story. That says something about our society, doesn't it? We can't even wait for the kettle to boil. We need to create those moments in our days. If this is going to be lived, when we are still and quiet and we withdraw from all the activity and we just seek God, we need to find those punctuation marks. We need the Bible. Somewhere within our beginning and ending or middle of the day or wherever, we need Scripture. Because we need to withdraw into God. And the way we need to do that is not just to be thinking about ourselves, but to have that outside influence, which is the power and the word of God. Prayer. Appropriate forms of prayer. It's right to have intercessory prayer as part of our prayer. But if that's the only prayer we pray, praying for others, praying for ourselves, we're missing out. We also need to develop patterns of prayer that develop this relationship. Earlier Christians in this land used circle prayers. I don't know whether you're familiar with them, but they would, they would consciously kind of draw a circle around. They would even use their finger, I think, and they'd just draw this circle, and they'd say, circle me, Lord. Circle me, Lord. It, you know, it's just one of those things. Circle me, Lord. Keep peace within. Keep disturbance out. It's just a way of consciously centering on Jesus. Just circle me, Lord. Circle me, Lord. I've got all this stuff going on. Circle me, Lord. What else did I put up there? Written also, I, I, the older I get, the grumpier I get. But that's another story. The older I get, just checking you're still with me, but the more helpful I find set prayers, particularly at the end of the day, See, at the end of the day, I want to stop thinking. I don't want to start thinking or I'm never going to go to sleep. Actually, at the end of the day, I find a set prayer really helpful because it can encapsulate some of the thoughts of the day but without sending my mind off in lots of new directions. Quietness, quietness, stillness, rest. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. One minute of real stillness is better than 10 minutes of trying to be still. It isn't about the quantity, it's 
just about those few months of withdrawing and discovering. Did you know that at the heart of your being right now is an incredible peace? Right now at the heart of your being is stillness beyond what you could ever imagine. Because right at the heart of your being now is who? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. The Spirit, do you remember, Jesus is incredible, isn't he? Jesus is under, we think we're under pressure. Jesus is under pressure. He's got to go and save this little girl before she dies. Right? Jairus' daughter. And he's on his way, and there's all these people pressing around him, wanting healing. And yet, in the centre of Jesus is this stillness. And he's so still and aware of what's going on, that when that woman touches just the tassel that hangs down here, in amongst that crowd, Jesus knows something significant has happened. And he's so still at the centre, Jesus, that with all the pressure to get to Jairus' daughter before she dies, and he doesn't, and it doesn't matter, in all that pressure, he stops and gives his full attention to this woman who needs it. Isn't that beautiful? Don't you want to live like that? Rather than this frantic, frenzied pressure, pressure, pressure. There is that stillness right in your heart right now. It's somewhere in mine as well. And that's what we need to withdraw to discover, to allow the Spirit of God. Let all the tumult within me cease. Enfold me, Lord, in your peace. What are you trying to control that you shouldn't? Who are you trying to control that you shouldn't? Who to you is Egypt? Who are you looking to? What are you looking to that actually you shouldn't to provide security and safety? These things obviously apply to uh, our individual lives, but how does this apply to our life as a church? How does it apply to the areas of church life that you're involved with? already. See, one of the things that cultivating this way of living does, it creates space for for God. I find this a deeply disturbing image. I find this a deeply disturbing image. Because if that's my life, am I trying to ram God into the shape I want him to be in my life? See, if we withdraw into God, then it allows him to do things the other way around. Because actually we need to allow our lives to be shaped around him, not try and shape God to fit our lives. And when we are still and quiet before God, it creates room for God to act. When we're trying to control everything, when we're trying to do all that stuff, God says, actually, I believe, I think we find it in this passage, God says, okay, he lets them go to Egypt. He knows it will end in disaster, but notice he still waits for them. Even when they're suffering the direct consequences of their stupidity, though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for a drink, he will still be with you to teach you. God stays with us. With these people, he still waits and waits. So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so that he can show his love and his compassion for the Lord is a faithful God. God is still waiting. He is always waiting. So how are we going to respond to this? Well, what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to have a time of quiet, okay? And um, the other things we had this morning have taken longer than we anticipated, but that's all right. What we're going to do is we're going to just take about 10 minutes, okay. Um, Ian, sorry, could you just pop out and tell Kids Church we'll be five minutes late? Thank you, just out of courtesy of them. And I will keep it to five minutes, thank you. Um, So what we're going to do, just in these last 10 minutes, okay, um, what's God been saying to you? And what we want to do really this morning now in this 10 minutes is just create some time and space to encounter him. The prayer team are going to come out to the front in a few moments' time and they'll happily pray with you. You know, we've had Bob's testimony this morning. Um, God is here. 
we don't look convinced about it, but God is here. And, and actually, we just don't know. If, if you have the courage to step forward for prayer, you don't know what he will do. Uh, we've also, uh, George is going to be um, just leading that prayer team as well, praying for healing. Uh, if you would like anointing, just to saying, I am responding afresh to God's call in my life to seek him above everything, then there'll be anointing available as well. If actually God has been speaking to you and he thinks, you know, I just really need to get out and think this through, then leave. We'll still let you come back for coffee. If it's more helpful for you to go for a wander, go and do it, okay? I can tell you from here, it's dry out there, not very warm, but okay. If you find it helpful, I invite you to stand to start with. If you don't find it helpful, remain seated, okay? Um, just, if you guys could remain, don't, don't play anything yet, okay, but get in, get in situ, that would be fantastic. And Stuart, you'll probably be thinking about what we will sing, okay. But I'm going to read to start with, first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read part of Romans 6 and use that as a prayer of repentance and also recognising the reality of these verses. This is who we are in Jesus. And then we are going to be silent for a while as we withdraw as individuals into the presence of our consciously into his presence. The Apostle Paul then says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have we forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death, for we died. We were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live as he lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. And so, Father, we confess to you that we have not followed you as we should have done. We confess to you, Lord, that we've looked to Egypt. We confess to you, Lord, that we've sought to control the outcome in our lives when all we needed to do was trust you. Lord, we release these things to you. Lord, we repent. We change our mind about these things. And we thank you, Lord, that you are sufficient. Thank you, Lord, that you are sufficient. Lord, we return to you. We rest in you. And we know that you will save us. Teach us, Lord, that quietness and that confidence. Teach us, Lord, that in quietness and confidence is your strength. So let's be still and quiet before God. Let's just remain quiet, okay? Let's keep focused on Jesus. Let's rest in him. And as we look into his face, let's um, allow all the concern, you know, all the telephone calls, all the, the stuff of life, just to find its place as we're still before Jesus once again. So, Father, thank you for your amazing peace. 
And we welcome your peace afresh into our lives. In your precious name. Amen. So this will be our final song. Okay, Jessica, do you want to not sing and come? Um, and George as well, step forward. So if you would like prayer, then um, take the opportunity, okay? And come forward. Prayer team, it would be great if you could come forward as well. Let's stand together, shall we? What are we going to sing, Stu? Amazing Grace, but a different one. Amazing Grace. Yeah, no, not quite this. We'll sing to you. Sing with us. Yeah, <laughs> that's lovely. As long as we've got the words. That's it's the right song. I'm sure it is. <laughs>